Indeed, there is no other name like Jesus. Today we're looking at called to service. Called to service. Um, this continues from Matthew chapter 10. So we're at Matthew chapter 11 today. I want to thank God for the privilege again of being able to share these chapters in the book of Matthew. It has been a tremendous blessing even to myself as I share them with you and research what the Lord is doing. And the, 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 uh, the messages that comes out of it, they're tremendous. I trust they will bless your hearts. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and entreat you for your mercy this morning. Father, we know that your grace is sufficient and it is available as well. As we humble our hearts before you, we ask, Lord, that, that you, you will manifest yourself amongst your people even today. This word is not ours. It is your word and it is your work. And we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will take full control. Hide me behind the cross and grant that each one of us as we fellowship to, and tabernacle with you, that your word will touch our hearts. Grant that your name will be honored and glorified and sanctified is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. So call to service is the, this is the name of the study this morning. Called to service. You know, when we are called to service, we believe often that it is a nice experience. It's wonderful. When we look at how the disciples responded when Jesus called them, they left what they were doing and they came. And as they came, it gave the impression as though, you know, what I'm doing, what I'm getting into is so beautiful, it's so wonderful. It is such a, um, is a wonderful experience, but those disciples suffered and they learned through difficult experiences. And uh, being called to service is not straightforward, it's not a bed of roses. It is very challenging and it is very testing. The Bible says in the book of Matthew 11, 1, it says it came to pass when Jesus has made, had made an end, sorry, of commanding his 12 disciples. He departed as thence, it says, to teach and to preach in their city. So he, he let the disciples go and then he began to work in the cities nearby, the surrounding cities. But something happened. Something happened. John, the Baptist, died. What does this have to do with the work of the disciples? And what does it have to do with the work that Jesus was doing? Well, these are Vigils 360, paragraph 4 says, that while the disciples had been absent on their missionary tour, Jesus had visited other towns and villages preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And it says it was about this time that he received tidings of the Baptist that John was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. You know that? John had been called to serve. And we're all called to serve. Amen? We're all called. I am called to serve. You are called to serve. No, none of us escape. We're all called to do something for God, to serve. But here was a servant 
who had died, a beloved servant. How significant was this? How significant was this? Let us go. Verses 2 to 4 says, Before John died, his faith was tested. It says, When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ. So John was hearing all that Christ was doing. John was hearing it. So he sent to his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? No. John, as John was preaching the gospel, John was con. It was confirmed to John by the Holy Spirit that Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, it was John who pointed Jesus out and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So John was doing, not only, he was a prophet. Jesus called him more than a prophet. Right? But now John is in prison. John's faith is down. He is tested. You see, on the mountain top, we it is easy to exercise faith, but in the valley, it's a different matter altogether. We have a lot of expectations, and John and his disciples probably felt that Christ should come to my rescue. After all, I did the work of God. I had been working. I had been the forerunner. I had been called to 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 be to herald the coming of the Messiah, and now I'm in prison. And so here was John's question. Jesus answered and said unto them, Jesus spent a whole day, by the way, and the first does not bring this out, but Jesus spent a whole day teaching and so on. And at the end of the day, he answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. In other words, Jesus did not give an answer as to say, I am, yes, I am the Messiah. He says, look, see, and go and tell John what you are convinced. Today, is any conviction coming to your heart? Are you convinced of anything? That is, that is the, the answer that if Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah. That is, who, that is what tells us if Jesus is who he says that he is. And so in verses 5 and 6, the Bible history historically re, re, um, relates what the disciples of John saw. It says the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. It says the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. It says the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, Jesus says, whosoever shall not be offended in me. In other words, he was saying to John, listen, listen, John. You pointed me out. Don't be offended in me. Not because the chips are down. And when the chips are down, then our faith is tested. It was a gentle reproof. John, keep your faith. But what does all of this mean to us as a people? You know, we're told in Review and Herald, March 4, it says, in these words, John is gently reproved for his impatience. In other words, John was saying, look what happened to me and nothing is not being done for me, my sake. It says, the cautious reproof returned to John was not lost. Upon him. In other words, he accepted it. He understood. Listen, John, God is working. You need to be patient. You're in prison. You're going through the doldrums. You are going through a rough experience in your homes, with your families. You have a lot of difficulties and tri- trials. Be patient. God is still on the throne. The Bible says, sorry, inspiration says it was not lost upon him. It says he then better understood the character of Christ's mission. He had a better understanding. He understood right there and then that suffering is a part of everything. It's a part of the package called to serve. Praise the Lord. Called to serve. And it says, 
And with submission and faith, he yielded himself into the hands of God. This is what we heard about Luther this morning, right? With submission and faith, he yielded himself into the hands of God to live, praise the Lord, or to die as should best advance God's glory. What is, what is it that God is requiring of you that's so hard this morning? What is it that God is saying to you that is so hard, so difficult to challenge for you? And God is saying that it might not appeal to your heart as to whether this should be right. But listen, submission and faith will bring peace. Submission to God. Faith in what God is doing. Faith in what God is doing in your life. Steps of Christ, page 120. Paragraph 1 says, There is many a brave soul, sorely pressed by temptation, almost ready to faint, it says, in the conflict with self and the powers of evil. So souls might be brave, or you might be brave, but everyone, like Luther, has a trial. And listen, do not discourage such a one in his hard struggle. Praise the Lord. Do not discourage, God is preaching the same message, do not discourage such a one in his hard struggle. Cheer him with brave, hopeful words that shall urge him on his way. Somebody came to Luther, another person came to Luther, and they spoke words of courage. Thus the light of Christ may shine from you. Praise the Lord. Shine from you. It says, none of us live at himself. By our unconscious influence, others may be encouraged and strengthened, or they may be discouraged and repelled from Christ and the truth. So our lives were called to have an influence for good, to win, to bring others, to help others, to encourage others. You have your down moments. I have mine too, you know? But who really was John? Who really was John? Remember, we're looking at call to service. Who really was John? The Bible says, as the disciples of John departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, listen, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? He's asked a question. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, he says, they that wear soft clothing are where? Are in king's houses. But what went he out for to see? He says, a prophet? There's a question. Yeah, yes, he says, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. So John Jesus was speaking of John, and he was saying that you went out to see more than a prophet. In other words, understand the deep significance of who John really was. In verse 10 and 11, Jesus said this about John. He says, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face which shall prepare thy way before thee. In other words, he's saying John was the messenger that came to herald his own coming, the coming of the Messiah. Praise the Lord. John came before Christ, and he was heralding. He was saying, listen, he's a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. Listen. He said, verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there had not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's Christ's testimony, you know. This is the testimony of Jesus Christ, believers, concerning John. He said they had not risen a greater than John the Baptist, and notwithstanding, 
He says, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So those who heard and were audience in, 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 as Christ preached, they were even greater than John. They saw more than John. John was the forerunner, and then he died in nine months. Reviewer Herald again says, puts it this way. It says, not only was John a prophet to foretell future events, but he was a child of promise. Christ was a child of promise, right? John was a child of promise. Listen. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. How many of us have this experience? Listen. He was ordained of God to execute a special work as a reformer. And you know John's dress reform and John's diet reform was top of the order. And it says, in preparing a people for to receive Jesus Christ. And then it says, the prophet John was the connecting link between the two dispensations, between the Jewish and the Christian. John, special work. Wow. So John was more than a prophet. We are told in great controversy that the 70 weeks or 490 years, especially allotted to the Jews, ended in AD 34. So the time of the Jewish nation was coming to an end. And it says, at that time, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, what brought it to an end? Look at it. Through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed what? Its rejection of what? Of the gospel. By what? By the martyrdom of Stephen and what else? And the persecution of the followers of Christ, which we spoke of last Sabbath. These things helped the gospel. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. You can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. But nonetheless, the nation of Israel was sealing its end. It was sealing its doom. Sealing its rejection. We are told that after that sealing, the message of salvation, no longer restricted to the chosen people as Christ said, go not into the Gentiles, but to the house of Israel, the lost sheep. No, it was going to the, to the Gentiles. It was no longer restricted to the chosen people. It was given to the world. Two dispensations, so one dispensation into another. And the Bible says, Jesus continues to speak. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. In other words, John took the kingdom of heaven by force. Another man who took the kingdom of heaven by force was Jacob. These men wrestled in prayer. We heard about prayer this morning, the importance of prayer. We heard about Luther's prayer when he found himself in dire straits. Believers, listen, that is so important for us to understand. We are going to find ourselves, and God will permit it. God will permit us to find ourselves often in dire straits where we can hardly get out unless we pray. You're going to find that you are in trouble often. Some problem in the home. Something you want to accomplish. Something you have to get done. What, is it, what does it mean to take the kingdom of heaven by force? What does that mean? What does that mean? Our Father Cares, 136 says, The violence here meant is a holy earnestness. Such as Jacob manifested. It says calmly, persistently. We are to press our petitions at the throne of grace. Find the time. 
if you if stop what you're doing, you're too busy. Find time to spend with God. Time in prayer is precious. Things ain't going, are not going right, but stop and pray. We have tasks to accomplish, and it is impossible to get us done. Stop and pray. You don't have enough time, Satan says, and God says, you have more than enough time if you pray. Because when you pray, he will get it done so much faster, brethren. But you think that you have to keep at it because you have to get it done. And God is saying, that's, if, that is, that's going to take more time if you keep working. But if you stop, it will take less time. Our work, therefore, it says, is to humble our souls before God, confessing our sins, be honest, and in faith, draw nigh unto God. It is the design of God to reveal himself in his providence and in his grace. So God designed things to work that way, that he reveals himself when you least expect it to, put, to, to allow his providence and his grace. God, God, God gives you. But not when you try in without God. It doesn't work. The object of our prayers must be the glory of God, not the glorification of ourselves. Tell something about yourself. You want to get it down to look good. And God says, stop and pray. So that when it's done, it'll be to my glory. Praise the Lord. We don't understand these things, how they work. Manuscript 17 says, the worker who labor in humble dependence upon God, seeking his counsel at every step, will be guided by heavenly wisdom. And that is what we need. I need more, uh, more and you need more of divine, oh, praise the Lord, wisdom. To think about what next to do. To trust God. Let them not trust in their own feeble efforts. That's not my words. Our efforts are feeble, really. But trust in God and pray to Him in faith. We need to cultivate that persevering faith which will hold fast to the promises, claim the promises. Point to the promises. So, Lord, you said so and so and so. And trust God. Trust God. Humble yourself, it says. But exalt God. Amen? Humble yourself. But exalt God. Empty the soul of selfishness and sin. And lay hold of God's power then you can claim his promise. Ask, and you shall receive. Oh, praise the Lord. What an experience is waiting for those who will comply. So Jesus continues, says, John came, neither eating nor drinking. And they say, yeah, the devil. John was called to service, and they found fault with John. And then Jesus says, I come eating and drinking. And they say, you're a glutton. You have a spirit. Right? You're a friend of publicans and sinners and you eat with them. They found the fault. Jesus was the light of the world. Jesus was the light of the world. The Bible says, Jesus said in verse 20, of Matthew 11, he says, the Bible says he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they did not repent. Look, the important thing for each one of us, and this is very important for me and for you and for all of us as we are privileged to be in the presence of God, is to repent. 
Simple. Repent. Jesus says, you get light that Sodom they have. You get light that, that those cities in the past did not have. You have me, the light of the world. Repent. He said, my mighty works are done here, here and you're not repenting? The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that the people that walk in darkness prophesying of the time of Christ, that was darkness. He says that those people saw a great light because they saw the living Jesus Christ. And the Bible says they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them had the light shined. Jesus was the light of the world. So Jesus says in verse 21 and 22, he says, We want to see Chorazin. We want to see Bethsaida. These are the cities where he worked. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. Jesus is saying, what's happening here? They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes when God, when God sent Jonah to Nineveh. You remember what happened? The people, the king, everybody, even the animals, repented in sackcloth. Jesus says, is saying, I'm the light of the world. I'm here, and you're not repenting? So he says, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. The light that we have today, what about us? Do we have light today? The light that we have today, it says, was not given. This is youth's instructor, December 15. It was not given to Sodom. So we have light that Sodom didn't even have, brethren. And what are we doing with it? It says, like Chorazin, we are exalted to heaven. For it is our privilege to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. That's our privilege. But it says, if the mighty works that have been done among us had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they might have remained unto this day. If they saw Christ himself, they might have repented. Further, same quote says, if the nations that have been destroyed had understood the grace that has been manifested toward us, they might have rejoiced in the glory of God. Sometimes you wonder, you think about yourself and you say, well, I have great light, but what am I doing with it? But it will be more tolerable for those nations in the day of judgment than for those who have failed to improve greater opportunities and privileges. Wow. See, we are judged according to light. And Christ said it in, he says, Thou Capernaum, verse 23, 24, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Why? For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So Jesus is saying that you are blessed, but the blessings that you have are take for granted. If others had it before you, they would have really grabbed hold of it. But I say unto you, he says, that I shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Christ says of his people, he says, ye are the light of the world. I am the light of the world, but ye are the light of the world. So Jesus was the light of the world, but we are also the light of the world. And what does he say? In Review of Herald, July 28 says, ye are the light of the world. It is not a small matter. It's not a small matter that the counsels and purposes and plans of God have been so clearly opened to us. This is not a small matter. So when you get light so bright, clearly open to you and to me, that's not a small matter. It says to understand the will of God as revealed in the sure word of prophecy. 
This places on us, however, listen, a heavy responsibility. God expects us to impart to others the knowledge he has given us. Privilege, service, call to serve. It is his purpose, it says, that divine and human instrumentalities shall unite in the proclamation of the warning message. Wow. So God is saying, you got privileges, but these privileges are actually a call to serve to service. The privileges that are granted to you and I, they're actually a call to say, come and serve, because it's a responsibility. Jesus continues, he says, at that time, he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because I was hid these things from the wise and prudent, but you've revealed them unto babes. You've, re you've revealed them unto hearts that are more receptive to truth. Babes. Those who are willing to learn. You know, we're told in the book, 1 Corinthians 1, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, verse 26, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, because they're not, they're not babes. So nothing is revealed to those who are wise in their own conceit. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God says, let me take this Babe. You know, most of the prophets that lived in the days of Christ, or even, sorry, before, they were not men that anybody would pay a cent for. Amos was a shepherd. You don't have regard for those people, but God said, I, this is my man, Amos, and he used a simple shepherd as a prophet. So, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The word says, it says God has chosen what? What else? The weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. It says the base things of the world, the things which are despised. That's what God chooses. I don't like him or don't like, don't dig her head. God said, I chose her, you know. I've chosen her. We need to be humble. Base things which are despised as God chosen, things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh, no flesh should glory in his presence. So as we begin to wind down, look at these few verses as we, as we begin to wind down. In verse 27, Jesus began to say something that's very important. The Bible says that Jesus says these words. All things, he says, are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man, not the Son. You see, Jesus was speaking of himself. He was despised. The rabbi says that is not the Messiah that we were preparing for. He looks too simple. He can't do anything for our nation. So he was despised. The Bible says in, in the book of Isaiah 53, he was despised and forsaken. So Jesus is saying now that as despised as I was, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man, not the Son, but the Father, Neither not any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is saying, whoever you regard me, you will not know the Father. We have religions today that says, we don't go to God, Jesus, we go straight to the Father. But the Word of God tells us in the book of John, that no man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus Christ. The Son, if Jesus does not reveal the Father to us, we will never know him. And so, gospel workers, 
We look at page 35. It says we are living in perilous times. And it does not become us to accept everything claimed. We've got to be babes and humble and receptive and teachable. But it says this. There's a caution. Humility must be combined with diligence. So we're not ex accept everything claimed to be truth without thorough examination. Neither can we afford, sorry, to reject anything that bears the fruits of the Spirit of God. So listen, but we should be teachable, praise the Lord. We should be meek and lowly of heart. You see, there are those who oppose everything that's not in accordance with their own ideas. And by so doing, they endanger their eternal interests as verily as did the Jewish nation in their rejection of Christ. So we have to balance. We have to have a balance between humility and diligence. So Jesus continues. In verse 28 to 30, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn of me. For I am what? For I am what? I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. What is the yoke? What is the yoke? Let's look at this as we close. These are verses 3 to 9. We want to close with this thought from this spirit of prophecy. It says, The yoke that binds to service is the law. Of God. Listen, if we were left to follow our own inclinations, and you know inclinations how they work, you want to you should get up in mornings at four, but you just feel like sleeping. That's a natural inclination. And when you find when you decide to sleep, you have given in to that inclination. So, but there's a yoke, praise God. So the yoke that binds to service is the law of God. But if we were left to follow our own inclinations without the yoke, listen, to go just where our will would lead us, we should fall into Satan's ranks and become possessors of his attributes. But God says, I put a yoke upon you so that you will not, you will not do as you want. You will do what God wants. Praise the Lord. Listen. The yoke of service Christ himself has borne in humanity. He's our example. So when it comes to bearing the yoke, Jesus bore the yoke of service. And listen now. Listen. He said, I delight to do as I will. Oh my God, yeah. Thy law is with my heart. He says, I came down from heaven. Listen to the yoke. The yoke not to do mine own will. That is the yoke. But the will of him that sent me. Praise the Lord. Not to do my own will. And so the Bible says, love for God. Zeal for his glory. This is emotive. And love for fallen humanity. Brought Jesus to earth to suffer and to die. This was the controlling power of his life. This principle. He says, adopt this same principle. Then you have on the yoke of Christ. This is the principle. This is the yoke. Let your love for God. Let your zeal for the glory of God. Let your love for fallen humanity be the driving force, the motivating factor of all that you do for God. And you're wearing the yoke of service. You have answered the call to service. And you have on the yoke of Jesus Christ. That is the call to service. May God help each one of us as we answer that call. That call is given to each one of us today. Will you answer the call? Will I answer that call? Let us pray. And so, Father in heaven, 
Again today, Lord, we are so grateful, so grateful, and we're thankful for Matthew 11. We have a deeper insight into the message given in the life of Christ. And the call to service, we can see, is a call, even as we look at the life of John the Baptist and the death of John, we can see that it's a call to serve even in death, even in martyrdom. We can find that the call leads us. But Father, you, you says that the servant is not greater than his Lord, and persecution is the lot of the, of the disciples. We ask you, Lord, to give us that, give us a call again and again, and help us to see and understand that it can be a call to die. And any day, we can be asked to give up our lives that someone might be saved. Oh, Father, give us a martyr's faith when the time is right. May we always be ready to do whatever is God's will. Bless your people. Strengthen our faith in Jesus. May we have a closer relationship and a walk with Jesus. Is my humble prayer as we seek for it in Jesus' name. Amen.